Thank you for joining us virtually for this fifth lecture in our fall 2023 continuing education lecture series. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this with webinars such as this one, as well as on-campus presentations, online courses, videos, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. I now invite Father Michael McCarthy, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, to introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation, Black Theology's Passion, Commensurate with the Wounds of the Oppressed. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Professor Lorraine Marie Mosley is a sister of Notre Dame of the United States. Their U.S. center is in Chardon, Ohio. Professor Mosley joined St. Mary's University, which is located in San Antonio, Texas in 2022 as an associate professor of Catholic systematic theology and as the Miller Chair in Human Dignity. She has a doctorate in systematic theology from the University of Notre Dame. She pre previously served as assistant professor and chair of the religious studies department at Notre Dame of Maryland University. Professor Mosley's research interests include womanist theology, issues of race, Black Catholic history, and the theology of Edward Skillebex. Her articles have been published in Horizons, Concilium, American Catholic Studies, the Journal of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium, and New Theology Review. Professor Mosley has likewise contributed multiple book chapters on topics such as theological anthropology and intercultural communities for mission with a focus on race and gender. We're delighted to have her join us virtually for this presentation. Welcome, Professor Mosley. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to join you this evening. Welcome to all. Introduction, Black liberation theology has much to offer the wider Christian community. James Hal Cohn, the father of Black theology, displayed throughout his life and his formidable corpus, what it means to acknowledge Black experience as an indispensable source when doing theology. He believed that because Black theology is survival theology, it must speak with a passion consistent with the depths of the wounds of the oppressed. The historical record attests to the hatred and injustice leveled against the African-American community in the United States and in other regions of the Atlantic slave trade. This same passion has also fueled the black church. For Cone, the language of theology must be passionate, a language of commitment, because it is a language which seeks to vindicate the afflicted and condemn the enforcers of evil. Too often, after the killing of unarmed African-American men, men, women, and children by law enforcement, there is no place for Black Catholics to go to manage the psychic violence and homegrown terrorism they have known. Catholic religious leaders are either silent or they speak with no passion, some suggesting that they do not wish to invite incite violence. When they do make comments, they immediately follow them by affirming law enforcement in the very next breath. Cohn concludes that American theology is racist. It identifies theology as dispassionate analysis of the tradition unrelated to the sufferings of the oppressed. Moral theologian Brian Massengale has made the broader claim suggesting that to say that racial injustice is not a major concern of Catholic social teaching would be an understatement. Such a record makes it hard to believe that these leaders have the heart of a shepherd 
or understand the urgency of the moment for people who are walking, driving, or studying while Black. Thankfully, some letters written from individual bishops addressed to their dioceses and archdioceses have been marked by passion, compassion, hope, and care, and tailored to the members of their flock. In the pages that follow, I will revisit two Catholic ecclesial gatherings that took place in Baltimore, Maryland, over a century apart, to observe responses or lack thereof on the part of bishops who are the official teachers of the Catholic faith. Then I will briefly engage the burgeoning gift of synodality in the hopes that African-American Catholics, God's image in black, can experience a church that can be prophetic, accountable, and fruitful into the 20th century and beyond, especially on behalf of the oppressed. Part two the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore. The year was 1866 when the bishops of the United States gathered for the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore in the country's premier see and first diocese. In Dom Cyprian Davis's magisterial work, The History of Black Catholics in the United States, he recounts the circumstances surrounding the plenary council. At the midpoint of the Civil War, Henry Binsay, the Holy See's agent in New York, conveyed to the Congregation of the Propaganda that it would no longer be possible for the church in the United States to maintain a political policy of reticence and abstention. Chattel slavery, after all, rendered bonds persons property, thus violating all of their human rights. Baltimore Archbishop Martin J. Spaulding reached out to Cardinal Barnabo, the prefect of the Congregation of the Propaganda, a year before the end of the Civil War and requested that a second plenary council be convoked. One reason Spalding gave for wanting to bring together the U.S. bishops was to discuss a pastoral plan to address the evangelization and the spiritual needs of the soon to be emancipated Black Americans. Barnabo gave his approval for this second plenary council and shared Spalding's apostolic concern for this population. In Spalding's letter to Archbishop McCloskey of New York, informing him of the upcoming council, Spalding referred to the present moment as a golden opportunity for reaping a harvest of souls, which neglected may never return, unquote. Sadly, the majority of bishops were not open to the pastoral concerns shared by Spalding and Barnabo. Their personal views on the peculiar institution of slavery may have grounded their disinterest. Additionally, these bishops were provoked by the idea that a prefect who could be made a bishop would be in charge of this pastoral plan. Nevertheless, Davis notes two examples of bishops who had been in favor of slavery, becoming strong voices in favor of promoting the pastoral care and well being of formerly enslaved persons. Archbishop Spalding was one such example. Bishop Vinot of Savannah was another. Due to the massive amount of work on the agenda of the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore, the pastoral care of Black Americans was relegated to an extraordinary session that took place after the official close of the council. Davis states, quote, the council fathers rejected the notion of an ecclesial coordinator 
or prefect apostolic. In fact, nothing new was created to deal with the situation on a nationwide scale. It was decided that each bishop who had blacks in his diocese would decide what was best and work in concert with others in the provincial synods." Unquote. With this in action, a golden opportunity had become a missed opportunity. Additionally, this marked an early occasion when church leaders in Rome displayed a genuine concern for African descended people in the United States when the bishops of the nation were unable to do so. It appears that the bishops attending this extraordinary session were unable to get out of their own way so that they could discern how to care for the spiritual and pastoral needs of the soon to be freed black Americans. The published decrees of the council are both telling and ominous. Davis cites them, quote, the council decreed that it should gravely weigh on our conscience that all might have access to draw near to Christ, that all who administer the sacraments might be present to all who seek them. If through some stupidity, it should happen that this is not the case, one will merit the greatest opprobrium, who forgetful of his office shall not offer the means of salvation to all who seek, whether black or other, and who on account of this lack of care should perish spiritually." Unquote. Part three, fall 2019 meeting of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. 153 years after the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB, gathered in Baltimore for their fall meeting. One of the most significant exchanges during this meeting centered on their provisional updated draft of the 2015 document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. At issue was an amendment brought to the floor by Cardinal Blaise Supich of, New of Chicago to include paragraph 101 from Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Gaudete et Exultate, in its entirety. It reads as follows, quote, the other harmful ideological error is found in those who find suspect the social engagement of others, seeing it as superficial, worldly, secular, materialist, communist, or populist, or they relativize it as if there are other more important matters, or the only thing that counts is one particular ethical issue or cause that they themselves defend. Our defense of the innocent unborn, for example, needs to be clear, firm, and passionate, for at stake is the dignity of a human life, which is always sacred and demands love for each person, regardless of his or her stage of development. Equally sacred, however, are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned and the underprivileged, the vulnerable, infirm and elderly exposed to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking, new forms of slavery and every form of rejection. We cannot uphold an ideal of holiness that would ignore injustice in a world where some revel 
spend with abandon and live only for the latest consumer goods. Even as others look on from afar, living their entire lives in abject poverty, unquote. Supic's amendment attempted to amplify Pope Francis's wider teaching about human life being sacred in all its stages. With special attention to the poor and vulnerable. Nevertheless, the assembly of bishops rejected this amendment because some were apparently intent on not lengthening the document. According to historian and theologian, Massimo Fagioli, quote, the effort to neuter Pope Francis's message in the United States continues, unquote. Pope Francis could not have been more clear in paragraph 101 as he spells out that all of life is sacred and that suffering humanity especially demands the church's compassionate response. These sisters and brothers are Scilabex's threatened humanum in our midst, and they deserve a prophetic and ethical response that makes clear that these circumstances should not be and must be changed. The failure of the US bishops to incorporate the entire paragraph is another missed golden opportunity to highlight the church's largesse and preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. The lives of these sisters and brothers are marked by struggle and are often cut short due to violence, poverty, and poor health care. Part four, a synodal journey of creativity and responsibility. When speaking about the synodal process during an interview in 2013, Pope Francis affirmed, quote, we must walk together, the people, the bishops, and the Pope. Synodality should be lived at various levels, unquote. In September 2018, the International Theological Commission published the English translation of Synodality in the Life and Mission of the Church. In it, the authors break open this term and explain its use over the recent decades. Rooted in scripture and tradition, this concept, like the church, is both ancient and new. The International Theological Commission has indicated Pope Francis's role in the development of synodality and how he has highlighted St. Paul VI institution of the Synod of Bishops. Pope Francis has also explained that synodality is the path which God expects of the church of the third millennium. Creativity. Synodality and the path it opens can provide a space where the people of God can share, quote, the hopes, the joys and hopes, the griefs and the anxieties, unquote, that they experience in a manner that can form community. Black Catholics and other marginalized Catholics want to know that their Pope, bishops, sisters and brothers are passionate about injustice and will speak with urgency, consistent with the depth of the wounds of the oppressed. In a compelling article, Elissa Roper offers a refreshing explanation of what it means for the church to be synodal in synodality 
a process committed to transformation. This transformation is about journeying, creativity, and responsibility. When individuals are open to developing a new consciousness through the renewing of their minds, it is a deepening of their baptismal call and their walk with Jesus Christ. This transformation can enable our church community to face the stark reality of our institutional and personal involvement with racism, nativism, sexism, heterosexism, clericalism, and all types of inclusion. Then we need only pivot to face the hard, cold facts surrounding the global clergy sexual abuse scandal and cover up as accusations continue to surface, thus prompting our righteous indignation and passion consistent with the depths of the wounds of the oppressed. Synodality is a way of being in relationship where people can tell their stories of disappointment that their church community did not walk with them at moments of vulnerability, such as times past in the United States when black Catholic parishes were closed or when black Catholics individuals experienced discrimination in Catholic parishes, grade schools, or at mass. Creativity can happen along the synodal path as the faithful and their bishop speak frankly about their concerns and possible solutions. For instance, a parish community or entire diocese might form study circles based on Cyprian Davis's The History of Black Catholics in the United States. This is important since the history of Black Catholics is usually not included in histories of the Catholic Church in the United States. As long as members of the community are committed to listening to each other's stories, practices like these will move people toward a greater synodality and empathy. Responsibility. Roper maintains, quote, transformation for a synodal church at the universal level begins with an acknowledgement of the baptismal authority and responsibility of all members. It is with this spirit that individuals and groups can come to terms with sins of omission and commission regarding the promotion of the kingdom of God. Sins of racism, nativism, heterosexism, and clericalism are a good place to start where everyone can reflect upon their complicity against the backdrop of synodality and a commitment to walk with one's church community, even when it is uncomfortable. One way of being responsible is by understanding one's social location, literally and figuratively. For instance, Baltimore is the first Catholic diocese in the United States. It is also a city plagued with a high murder rate, the opioid crisis poor city management, the riots following the death of Freddie Gray in 2015, a history of housing discrimination and children suffering the long-term effects of lead poisoning. Add to this struggling public schools and the widening gap between the rich and the poor, and it is not hard to realize that this city cries out for justice. By being in tune with the location of their meetings, the bishops could very well allow this message to influence the spirit of the meeting. Something similar can be said for all of us. How can our social location 
have bearing on the choices we make and the things we spend time on. Conclusion. In this synodal spirit, all members of the church can journey together into our shared future, ever mindful of the dangerous memory of sisters and brothers who have passed and those who walk with us still. The process of remembering them is a gift and a challenge, as Johann Baptiste Mest would note. Quote, there are memories in which earlier experiences flare up and unleash new dangerous insights for the present. For brief moments, they illuminate harshly and piercingly the problematic character of things we made our peace with a long time ago. Memories of this sort are dangerous and incalculable visitations from the past. They are memories that one has to take into account, memories that have a future content. May our church community have the courage to be faithful stewards of these unpredictable, dangerous memories and to act upon them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mosley. Um, we're gonna dive right into questions. I think that you've given our audience lots to think about. Um, I'm gonna start with, why didn't the US bishops prioritize the soon to be emancipated slaves at the second plenary council of Baltimore and appoint an ecclesiastical coordinator to oversee a national evangelization plan? Thank you for that question, Megan. As I alluded to in the article, it was thought um, according to Father Cyprian Davis that they thought that this particular prefect could eventually be made a bishop. And I think there was just some concern that maybe someone would be made a bishop who was out of turn. And so that may have been one reason why um, there was not that um, enthusiasm for appointing this person who would oversee a national effort to be concerned about the newly emancipated slaves. That's one uh, reason for it. Uh, and another reason might be just the bishops in their own humanity and their own limitations, not perhaps being as concerned with those who were soon to be um, emancipated. It could have just been the human condition that left them less than enthusiastic about this particular um, concern. Mm -hmm. So those would be two of my thoughts on that particular topic. Thank you. And, and why the city of Baltimore? Why, why Baltimore was chosen for the site for the two ecclesiastical, ecclesial gatherings of the bishops? Well, as we mentioned before, Baltimore was the site of the first diocese, first Catholic diocese in the United States, but I was actually ministering as Father McCarthy noted at Notre Dame of Maryland University at the time when I uh, wrote this article. And I had known about the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore because I'm a graduate of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana. But then as I sat and I read about and heard about the USCCB's meeting in 2019, my brain started thinking about how interesting that these two different gatherings happened in Baltimore and how they could actually speak to each other. Mm. So I decided that um, I wanted to write an article that would look at the city of Baltimore and because the city is a, a wonderful city, but a city like most of our urban areas has so many challenges. And while I was teaching there, that was the time when there were those riots in the street and uh, due to the death of Freddie Gray in 2015. And I was just very deeply moved by 
the um, by the commitment of so many people that something like this would never happen again. And so I decided to use Baltimore as a site for this particular paper and it's turned out rather well. Yes, thank you. A um, few more questions. Uh, given your intimate knowledge of this history of black marginalization, understanding of the gospel call to liberation and your obvious sense of deep solidarity with the oppressed, what does it cost you to remain Catholic? Oh dear. Yeah, a big one. It cost me to remain Catholic. Well, I'm, I was born Catholic. My mother was born Catholic. My grandparents were born Catholic. It's who we are. And like a family, we realize that uh, there are limitations and that we have our blind spots. And I'm sure we could all acknowledge that to be the case that we are in families with broken human beings. But um, the church has always been a home for me. And I can't, I couldn't think of uh, belonging to any other religious tradition. It's just who I am. I was fortunate as a child to attend Catholic schools in New Rochelle, New York. And my mother was always a very faithful Catholic and she raised us to be likewise. Mm -hmm. So I think it's my background that keeps me hopeful. And of course there are things like, you know, the wonderful, our wonderful Holy Father who keeps me enthusiastic about the faith, especially as he gathers young people for different youth gatherings. All those things, of course, make me very committed to my faith and a faith that I trust will be a lifelong faith. So. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. There's a couple questions in the Q&A that I think are drawing upon your historical knowledge. So understandable if you don't know, but I, I'm going to pose, pose the questions. Um, so one, one of our uh, participants was asking about uh, if the American church had an official position on slavery before or during the Civil War, or was it left to individual bishops? Um, if they didn't have a position, uh, why? Why not? It doesn't, to, I will just answer these to the best of my ability. It doesn't appear that there was an official position. Um, maybe there was. Um, I'm just going back to the section in the paper mm -hmm. that I can't find at the moment, but it would appear that um, perhaps the US bishops at the time hadn't done their due diligence. Um, you know, the slaves, the enslaved persons were, you know, completely um, what? had their, as it says, as I read, chattel slavery after all rendered bonds persons property, thus violating all of their human rights. So I'm just uh, assuming that there was no um, Roman Catholic uh, statement about enslavement of African-Americans in the United States. Um, if there was, I would have expected to, I would have thought I would um, have known about it, but that's my um, that's my particular take on that. So if this violated all their human rights, then that would be a reason for us to have heard from them um, at a lot of different times throughout the institution of slavery. And to the best of my recollection, I I do not recall that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one participant asks, how can the church encourage Catholics of all races to walk together rather than apart on our synodal path? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think, um, you know, as I, as I glance at my article here, I think of what happened in 2015 with Freddie Gray. I don't know if everyone recalls that situation that happened in Baltimore um, in 2015 when there was a situation where a young man by the name of Freddie Gray was in a very large crowd. And I don't remember all the particulars, but I remember he was, um, he was a disabled young man and he was, uh, 
he was arrested at one point and taken on a very rough ride in a police um, vehicle. And that eventually uh, led to his actual passing. And at that situation, I just saw so much love and concern for Freddie Gray. And I think we could go back and we could mention, if I could remember, which I don't think I can, um, the names of so many people who have um, been injured seriously or died at the hands of others, sometimes sadly, that can include law enforcement. Um, I think just to see the response of the, of the world, of the people of God, of, of our Pope, um, when things like that happened really um, encourages me that we need to keep speaking out about these particular issues, even if our words are not polished. I know my words are not polished at this moment, but even if they're not polished, we still need to speak out against these situations so that, um, so that the people who are most vulnerable can truly be cared for. And as the, the Senate is just wrapping up this, this part, do, is there anything in particular you're going to be looking for in the document that they publish? Oh, that's quite a question. What am I looking for? I suspect the person that comes to mind would be the, um, although I don't know, I recall seeing something that there hasn't been enough time or there, it's too early to talk about women deacons. Um, perhaps there might be some overtures to ways that women can be more involved in the synodal process, even to the point of women deacons. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm that I'll be looking for, and I know many many people will be. And so that's one thing. But just walking together as the people of God, um, you know, that's our call, and I that we could find ways to do that more and more. I think um, Pope Francis is, you know, very deep concern for the care of the earth. This is all about walking together. This earth that we call home is a place for everyone to be safe. And unless we make better decisions about the, the earth and about how we manage the earth, unless we do that, then more and more people will suffer as we've seen in the past calendar year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know answering questions live is difficult, so I appreciate your your time and efforts in, in answering. But a couple more, if you're up for them, certainly. Okay. Um, given the constantly changing social and political environments, how do you see the future of Black liberation theology? Oh, that's a loaded question. How do I see the future? Thank you for that question. I see it as very. Um, in a very forward looking way. Not so long ago, I, I attended the Black Catholic Theological Symposium that was held at Emory University. And with the different theologians, we had wonderful conversations and we talked about a wonderful future for Black liberation theology. And in that particular case, that was particular to Black Catholic theologians. And so we came together and we heard uh, very fine presentations from our colleagues. And that was really wonderful. It made me more enthusiastic for Black liberation theology and what it can be for the future of our church and of theology in general. So I think um, there's a wonderful future and there's a wonderful group of um, new scholars at Black at uh, Boston College that I had a chance to meet. And that was very, very wonderful. I was very delighted to see them and their work was so engaging. So I take my hat off to each one of them. It was a nice group of um, new scholars, students and other new scholars from Boston College that you should be very proud of. Oh, thank you. 
to know some of them. Yes. Well, well, speaking of our esteemed faculty at Boston College, we have uh, one of our colleagues posted a question, Dr. Jamie Waters, who's a great friend of Continuing Ed, who thanks you for your presentation, and she very much so appreciates your work, um, especially your attention to social location. Um, she asked if you could please say more on how people preparing for ministry might be more attentive to social location. And can attention to social location help us to be more intentional and bold in addressing issues of racism in the church and world? Yes, attending to social location um, is so, so important. And this paper gave me a chance to really do that as I lived in Baltimore for about five years and got a chance to know the city. But social location is so important. And um, and really needs us to be a voice for telling these stories of what's going on throughout the entire world, but particularly where we are. Um, we can't forget the plight of people who are affected by so many difficult situations. I was just thinking today of those people in the Middle East who are affected by the Israel-Hamas war and especially the children and those who are um, being held hostage. Social location, this should become a part of our worldview, what other people are going through all around the world. And um, this can really help us to have hearts that are open and sensitive to the, uh, the needs of those who are most vulnerable. So, so could you possibly repeat the last part of that question for me? Sure, yeah. So the first part was preparing um, people for ministry and being attentive to social location. And the second question, can attention to social location help us to be more intentional and bold in addressing issues of racism in the church and world? I think it really can, because as I was reflecting upon my own remarks, I was starting to feel a, a bit bold that I was going to be sharing my critique of what our US bishops have said or what they haven't said, what they've done and what they haven't done. And so I think, yes, this, these types of conversations called forth a boldness that we need to speak our truth as we see it, we know we have our limitations, but when the Holy Spirit inspires us, it is for us to respond. And so I was happy to have this opportunity to have this kind of conversation. And I hope that my future will also hold opportunities for this kind of conversation that we, so that we can be bold and that we can assist all individuals, especially those who are in ministry that they can be um, an example for those that they teach. They can be an example for those that they teach of how to be bold and how not to be afraid to speak the truth as they understand it. Respectfully, of course, but nevertheless, speak the truth as they understand it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Dr. Waters also expresses her thanks. She appreci appreciates your boldness. So thank you for your response. And perhaps we will we'll close with one more question um, that kind of is full circle because it it ties into your, your title. Um, so this last participant question, beyond the call to remember in your dreams, what does a passion commensurate with the wounds of the oppressed look like? Well, it means it looks like every time an unarmed African-American loses their life as a result of an encounter, sometimes with law enforcement, sometimes not. It means that I'm upset, that this is very upsetting and just adds to the list, to the litany of individuals. Mm. I can't think of, um, of all the names of the individuals who have lost their lives in these circumstances, but it means that I'm angry that I'm justifiably angry as I reflect upon the lost gift of these individuals. 
And it means that I do my best to bring these up in the classes that I teach. Sometimes it's easier than other times because sometimes the students will be sitting there and I'm wondering how they're accepting what I have to say or why I'm bringing this up. But nevertheless, I'm doing it nevertheless because these are words that need to be heard. So it's um, being an example by the way that I live and by using the platform that I have as a, as a theologian, as a, as a theology teacher, as a writer to express my very, very deep sadness and discontent every time somebody loses their life in a situation when it didn't have to be that way. Mm. And so that's what I think is, is what um, I'm being called to. And also to continue to think and to continue to read and to stay involved with um, different topics that are in the news right now, whether it be the, this gathering taking place in Rome on the Synod, or be it other situations around the world that, um, that tug at our heartstrings. Um, all those things are ways that we can, um, well, just be better brothers and sisters to one another. I think maybe that's the best way to say it so that we can put an end to some of these manifestations of violence and, um, and hatred. Amen. Thank you for, for sharing your gifts, your passion. I think your passion definitely comes across for your work. And we're, we're so appreciative of you um, spending time with us this evening. Thank you so much, Professor Mosley. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate it. You're very welcome. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Thank you for your questions. We hope that you're able to join us next week for our annual Pine Lecture, a ministry with persons with disabilities. Thank you again, Professor Mosley. We hope you all have a great evening.